Who remembers Shine? No, not Dashine from ASAP Rocky and Skepta's recent hit single. I'm talking about Shine. No, I'm not talking about Quavo's repetitive ad lib of the same name. I'm talking about Shine. P Diddy's former protege who was once tipped to be the next big thing, but ended up getting 10 years in jail before getting deported. We all remember the formative days of Diddy, dancing in shiny velour suits, making legends out of artists like Mace and the notorious B.I.G., and of course being a master of self-promotion. But after the tragic death of Biggie in 1997, Puffy had been looking for a Biggie clone, but since science hadn't yet created a machine big enough to clone Biggie, he went for the next best thing. A young rapper named Shine Poe. Real name Jamal Barrow, Shine was born in Belize and grew up in Brooklyn. Yes, that is Belize where Biggie famously said that he would be smoking trees until they find him. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> So despite the fact that Shine was the son of a politician from Belize who would later go on to become the prime minister of the whole country, he didn't really grow up living a charmed life. Your pops is the deputy prime minister. Yeah. And he like basically disowned you, just... Yeah, you know, it was, you know, I was a bastard child. Shine was no stranger to the street life and he'd even done time in juvie for multiple robberies and hitting somebody with a stick with a nail in it. Is that what rappers mean when they say they're gonna pull up with that stick? Uh, he's done a board with a nail in it! And say it Shine had also taken a few bullets himself. I was in the streets and I got shot. But in 1998, Shine's fortunes changed after he was discovered freestyling outside a barbershop by DJ Clark Kent. I heard you were discovered outside of a barbershop. Yeah, man, you know, I was rapping every day. You understand? I just had fever. One day I just finished getting my little cut and I just seen this cat just walked up to him like, yo, I rap. You understand, you start to spin. Kent was a producer for Bad Boy Records and took Shine to one of the studios where he met Diddy. Diddy was so impressed that he actually signed Shine on the spot and offered him a very lucrative deal. Reportedly, the deal that he was offered was a multi-million dollar cash advance, two houses, three cars of his choice, and 100% of his publishing rights in exchange for five albums. It's like Christmas came early for Shine. On the fifth day of Christmas, Puff Daddy gave to Shine a five album deal. Four more badass hoes, three Bentleys, two fat cribs, and a 10 year sentence in the bling. This reportedly led to a relationship between Shine and Diddy, where Shine would literally follow Diddy around everywhere like his shadow, just trying to soak up any information that he could get about making it in the record game. But these easily gifted riches left Shine acting like a spoiled kid, and reportedly he was known for calling up the bad boy offices, asking for more money, and complaining about the cars that he'd been given. Given. He's not the messiah, he's a very bad boy. Hey, sorry. Apparently there was one incident where Shine was reportedly pissed that Puffy refused to buy him the Mercedes 600 model and would only shell out for the 500. So Shine asked the dealer that had sold him the 500 to put a 600 badge on the back, but hell, if you're gonna lie about what model you're driving, you might as well be pushing that Benz 5 million. Nice. But none of that mattered because a week later, he wrecks the car. Nice one, Shine. So did he sign Shine and reportedly he was considered Biggie's replacement. In fact, maybe a little too similar to Biggie. Shine had a deep, raspy voice which did sound a lot like Biggie's, but was kind of unusual for a guy that was so skinny and small. And quite frankly, if you go and listen to any of Shine's records, you are going to hear a dollar store Biggie Smalls. Honestly, bad boys are fucking dynasty. Ooze of the Glock, watch your ooze on the spot. Puff don't get a nod, nothing move on the- So Shine was being groomed to be the golden boy of bad boy records and would make high profile appearances on the albums of both Mace and Puff. Puff Daddy himself. But before Shine could even get the chance to drop his own solo effort, some shit would go down that would change Bad Boy in his life forever. On December 27, 1999, Shine hit Club New York in Manhattan, and he was joined there by Puff Daddy and his girlfriend at the time, Jennifer Lopez. You know, Jen from the block. Now in the same club that night were some tough Brooklyn street dudes. Specifically, a guy named Matthew Scar Allen and his friend Julius Jones, who supposedly were known to shine at the time, but more about those guys later. Now, there's a lot of conflicting reports about what actually went down that night. Scar and his crew were reportedly upset by Diddy bumping into them and some champagne being spilled. This apparently was combined with general disrespect of Diddy just flossing on everybody in a mink coat and dripping with diamonds. It's a bit annoying. So one of the people in Scar's crew apparently was really offended by this and decided to retaliate by throwing a stack of money in Diddy's face. Now here's where the timelines get a little bit tangled. Now at this point, the prosecution say that Shine pulled out a strap and started letting off shots into the crowd. But according to Shine, Julius was actually the one who pulled out a strap first. So Shine pulled out his gun and shot him in the shoulder. But I definitely shot 
the guy that was trying to shoot me, I shot him in the shoulder. At this point, security grabbed Shine, which caused his gun to go off in the air. When I hit the kid that, that tried to shoot me, that's when the security from the club, when he, you know, tried to grab me, and that's when the ratchet went off into the air. <clears throat> now in the confusion, a woman named Natania Rubin is shot in the face, but does survive. Shine later claimed that she was actually known to him as well. And I swear, Shine knows everybody in this club. You know that Natanya Rubin, that was my homegirl. Right. You know mm. what I'm saying? We, we knew Natanya. We used to go to the studio with her. And some witnesses suggested at this point Diddy pulled out a gun, which he denied. Following the chaos in the club, everybody runs outside, and Diddy and J-Lo manage to get back to his car, along with his bodyguard, Anthony Wolf Jones. The car was owned by Bad Boy Records, and somebody else was driving. Now, at this point, reportedly, Diddy's car swerved around a police blockade and drove for 20 blocks whilst being chased by the police, even running 11 red lights. Lopez fled the club, speeding away in his chauffeur Jeep. Police say a high-speed chase involving Combs, Lopez, and two of his men riding up front spanned 20 blocks up 8th Avenue through at least 11 red lights. And when they're stopped, a pistol is found under the front passenger seat in that car, as well as another pistol that's found on the floor along the route of the chase, allegedly thrown from the car. Meanwhile, Shine is arrested at the scene with a gun in his possession. And you know, I, I have my ratchet on me because I always have a ratchet on me, you know, self-defense, you know, I'm not going to get caught slipping. There was no world star back in those days. Shine got caught, as a matter of fact, when he ran out of the club that night. So everybody, including J-Lo, end up at the police precinct for the night. And reportedly at this point, Diddy tried to bribe his driver with $50,000 to take the rap for the gun on his behalf. Also offering him a $40,000 diamond ring that J-Lo had given Diddy as collateral. It's not a good look. So that kind of been a good morning after, but it took an entire year for this whole thing to come together and actually go to trial. And a lot of crazy stuff went down during that time. Shine went from golden boy to steaming turd real quick. Shine claimed that Puffy stopped talking to him throughout this entire period and actually attempted to block the release of his debut album. But in the end, that album did end up coming out in September of 2000. When Shine's self-titled album dropped, it ended up coming in at number five on the Billboard chart and moving around 900,000 units. But things wouldn't be good for Shine for very long, and in January 2001, just before the trial was set to start, he was actually in a car crash whilst driving without a license, leaving the two people in the vehicle in hospital with serious injuries. But Shine seemed to have escaped unscathed. But to be fair to him, you've got to be a pretty good driver to keep a Benz 5 million on the road. But still, not a good look for Shine, and it was actually after this incident that Puff Daddy's lawyer, Benjamin Brathman, asked Judge Solomon, who was ruling over the case, to try Shine and Diddy completely separately, though this was denied. Also, whilst this was going on, J-Lo and Puffy's relationship was publicly on the rocks, and there was a lot of speculation as to whether she would be called to the stand. During this time, J-Lo famously went to the Grammys with Puff Daddy while wearing an incredibly revealing dress, which supposedly was an attempt to try and distract the media from these pending charges. She wore that dress because Puffy was in a little bit of trouble then and it was a way to sort of deflect attention from him because you were looking nowhere but but right there Jennifer's barely there Versace gown did more than raise eyebrows on the red carpet. The dress caused a sensation on the Grammy website. This was a technique that was later used by Young Thug to distract people against his crimes against music as well as his role in the Lil Wayne tour bus shooting. So J-Lo publicly stayed with Puff Daddy in the lead up to the trial, but behind closed doors, she was getting piped by the backup dancer. Jennifer Lopez wanted to date Chris Judd. Chris Judd wanted to date Jennifer Lopez, but she was still with Puffy. Maybe she was just staying with him because of all the publicity. But there were lots of stories of she and Chris and people would see them every once in a while, you know, like kind of stealing moments. See Stormzy, nothing wrong with being a backup dancer. But with all of this stuff going on behind the scenes, eventually that big day came and it was time for Puffy and Shine to go to trial. Now this isn't just some case that disappears overnight. This is far too juicy for the media to let go of. So here's where things start getting really crazy. Shine was charged with attempted murder, assault, reckless endangerment, and possession of an illegal firearm. Diddy, along with his bodyguard Wolf, were charged with the possession of a legal firearm and bribery. Sean Puffy Combs faced the possibility of 15 years in jail on charges of gun possession and bribery. Julius Jones, one of the thugs that was there that night that was hit in the shoulder, as well as Natania Rubin, the woman that was shot in the face, both filed civil lawsuits against Puffy. 27-year-old Julius Jones of Brooklyn was in Club New York on December 27th and in the way of a stray bullet. I had no time to duck. It just hit me. I felt, you know, the burn sensation on my shoulder. I just dropped instantly to the floor. The and next thing he that. remembers after the bullet um, pierced his shoulder... People screaming, running, 
running from from the door to the exit, trying to you know get out the way. Julius says that he saw both Shine and Diddy holding guns in the club that night. And Natanya Rubin testifies that she saw Shine and Diddy both shooting guns in the club that night. And the doctor that examined her after the incident relayed to the court that she had said when she came into hospital that night that she had been shot in the face by Puff Daddy. Which is unusual because usually women that get shot in the face by Puffy end up getting a single deal. So finally, over a year after the shooting took place, it's finally ready to go to court. And Diddy assembles an impressive legal team that looks like the Avengers of acquitted assholes. This was an all-star team which included legendary lawyer, dead wife maker Goa Awea, and inventor of the Prince Albert, Johnny Cochrane. And he was joined by Benjamin Braffman, a famous mob lawyer who was known for defending Sammy the Bull Gravano. Before the trial's set to start, Puffy hosts a press conference. Puffy's legal position is pretty simple. Everything else is a lie and he's totally innocent. On Sunday evening, I went to Club New York. And under no circumstances whatsoever that I have anything to do with a shooting. I do not own a gun, nor did I possess a gun that night. Puffy barely speaks after his opening statement, which is unusual because he's usually always running his mouth, and his lawyer picks up most of the slack. It's a long press conference, but here are the main points. One, everybody is lying about Puffy having a gun. It was found in the front seat and had nothing to do with it. Mr. Combs went by himself in a limo with Miss Lopez, went to a club. He did not possess a gun. She did not possess a gun. Whatever happened at the club had nothing to do with him. Two. Puffy didn't tell his driver to run from the cops. Did Sean Puffy Combs tell him to drive away? No. Three, he denied any confrontation having ever taken place in the club. The police complained that someone threw money at him. Oh yeah, and you believe it. Okay. No one threw money at him, it's a lie. Now, one of the main arguments by the prosecution were the three guns. Now, three straps were recovered in total. One on Shine, one in the front of Diddy's truck, and one on the street recovered by the police that supposedly they had heard being thrown from the vehicle during the chase. But here's the kicker. All three of those guns were the same make, ammunition, and model, suggesting that they had all been purchased together. But don't get it twisted. These guns weren't purchased legally from your local ammunition. They were illegal Smith & Wesson handguns that had been reported stolen from Georgia. And on top of that, the prosecution called in a ballistics expert who suggested that if Puffy was standing exactly where witnesses had claimed he was standing at the time of the shootout, the bullet in the ceiling would have come from a gun that he was holding. One of the biggest bombshells came from Puffy's driver, Wardell Fenderson, who said that when he dropped Puffy off at the club in the SUV, he saw Puffy in the back holding a black handgun. Also, it has been brought to my attention that a number of you are stroking guns. Now, this is very interesting because if you go back to that initial press conference, he says that Puffy didn't even arrive in his own car, but he arrived in a different vehicle. Trying to make the case that if he didn't arrive in the car that the gun was in, then it couldn't have possibly been his. But if he left in a different car to the one that he arrived in and the gun was in that vehicle, then surely it's more likely that he was carrying that gun around with him, regardless of what vehicle he was in. He never went in that van to that club. He went in a private limousine. Hey, I don't know, call me Detective Traffler. Puff's driver Fenderson later testified that whilst he was in the precinct, he was offered a bribe by both Diddy and his bodyguard Wolf. Reportedly, Diddy leaned in and said to him quietly, I'll give you $50,000 if you say the gun is yours. So combine what the driver said about Puffy arriving at the club with a black gun with the fact that Natanya Rubin said that she saw Puffy pull out a black handgun and then felt that she was hit in the face by a bullet. I was just out with friends. <laughs> In another development today, Natanya Rubin, who was hit by a flying bullet during the shooting, criticized the media for focusing on Combs and Lopez rather than the victims. I'm not famous. Does that make me any less valuable? But on cross-examination, Puffy's defense made a compelling case that both witnesses were just motivated by money because of the fact that they had already filed a civil suit against Puffy. So that's Puffy's case, but Shine's defense was a little bit different. He was trying to get off on the basis of self-defense, suggesting that he wasn't the first shooter and that Julius, who he'd shot in the shoulder, had shot at him first. He also said that the bullet that hit Natanya in the face might not have been from him and could have been a ricochet. He affirmed this years later after his release on the Combat Jack show. What was that second that made you say, fuck this? 
out of that second was when somebody reached for their strap. When I hit the kid that that tried to shoot me, that's when the security from the club went and, you know, tried to grab me, and that's when the ratchet went off into the air. Mm. Now, Shine said that he had heard death threats made to Puffy in the club that night, and Julius Jones did admit that death threats had been made. But the prosecution completely tore this apart as a defense because under New York law, a verbal death threat is not enough for you to retaliate with deadly force. Shine brought forward a witness that said that somebody else shot first, but the prosecution clapped back, bringing five witnesses who all said that they saw Shine fire into the crowd three times. But yet another curveball was two late accusations of witness tampering against Diddy for supposedly denying speaking to two defense witnesses when phone records proved that he had. They also brought up two incidents in the past where Puffy had been associated with illegal guns, which he denied. The DA brought up two former incidents in which Puff Daddy is also allegedly being investigated for possessing stolen guns during concerts in two other states. Incidents, he says, never happened. This afternoon, jurors sent the judge two notes, one of which asked for a transcript of a phone message Combs left Wardell Fenderson, once his driver, now the prosecution's star witness. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of this court case was the absence of Matthew Scar Allen, one of the thugs that had supposedly instigated the incident that night. Now, Scar was actually known to Shine before this incident took place, and Shine even admitted later on that he had sent Scar on missions in Brooklyn before. And Scar was a little tough guy, you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't send Scar to do missions for me. Hey, Scar, it's your boy Shine. I got a mission for you. Meet me at the parking lot with a hair dryer and some dental floss. We're gonna turn this 500 into a 600. Scar was initially scheduled to appear at this trial, but never did because he got a gun charge and failed to appear in court going on the run and becoming a fugitive in the process. But in another shock development, Scar was eventually captured. And while he refused to testify in this case, he did offer a verbal description of what happened that night, which was written up by a senior investigator and signed by Scar himself. The statement essentially said that a third man in their group had thrown the money in Puffy's face after being offended by Puffy knocking over Scar's drink. He then says that Puffy pulled out his gun and opened fire from only four feet away. Puffy rebuked this, saying that he was never closer than eight feet to Scar Allen at any time and there were always people in between them. He also went on to say that he pretty much had no idea why Scar was screaming at him in the club. Which is funny, because usually people have no idea why Diddy is screaming at them. But in another interesting revelation from Scar's letter, it was revealed that apparently Puffy and Scar both had dueling hits out on each other. According to Puffy's lawyer, he had received death threats at the bad boy offices by phone, which had specific details about how Scar had this hit out on him. In addition to that, somebody associated with Scar had actually been spotted outside the courthouse talking into a walkie-talkie and giving details of Puffy's security detail. But in that signed statement, Scar went on to elaborate, saying that he didn't want to testify because he believed a $50,000 hit had been put out on him by Diddy. Supposedly, Diddy had reached out and offered a $250,000 bribe for him not to testify, but he received information that he would be killed when he went to pick up that bag. Madness. But these details were all conjecture and they weren't actually allowed to be put forward in court. So after a grueling five week trial and over a year after this shooting had even taken place, the court was finally meeting to deliberate and give their verdict. You can see here Diddy arrives for deliberations followed by his lawyer seemingly carrying his packed lunch. The closing arguments are given and the prosecution say that Diddy essentially tried to use his money, power and fame to try and get out of a situation that he was responsible for. Which doesn't really sound like Puffy to me. I mean, he also uses violence to get what he wants. But Puff's defense was keep it zipped. He didn't have an argument with Scar, he didn't see any money thrown at him that night, and he didn't tell the driver of the SUV to keep driving. And he didn't say anything to the other occupants of the SUV during the police chase. So in March 2001, the verdict was given and Puffy and his bodyguard Wolf were found not guilty on all charges. Puffy gave a well-considered and thoughtful response. <laughs> Sorry, wrong clip. I want to just thank God for, for just being here for me and just, just protecting me. My lawyers bringing me these two great lawyers, three great lawyers. Johnny Cochran claimed that this was the last criminal trial that he was doing before he was going civil full time, and what a way to go out. Though I personally think getting OJ off a second time for the sequel would have been a much better way to go out. But as we all know, Shine wasn't so lucky. Though he was acquitted of the most serious charge, attempted murder, he did end up taking the rap for all the other charges. So that's first degree assault, 
reckless endangerment and possession of an illegal firearm, and he was facing 10 years in prison. After the trial, Shine spoke out publicly against Diddy. He said that Puff lied about the two of them being close and their intentions to meet at Club New York that night. He also claimed that a bouncer that testified in the trial that they jumped onto Diddy when the shooting started, proving Puffy didn't have a gun, was lying. Puffy's response to this was pretty compassionate, and he actually said, I'm deeply saddened about Shine's conviction. I believe that Shine had no intention of hurting anyone. My own victory is bittersweet because of what happened to Shine and the victims. Oh, and he also added at the end, uh-uh, uh-uh. So after the case, Puffy got a slew of civil lawsuits that totaled around a billion dollars and change. This included Ruben, who wanted 150 million, Julius Jones, who wanted 700 million, a third shooting victim called Robert Thompson, who wanted 50 mil, that driver that was offered a bribe wanted 3 million, and the club venue wanted 1.8 million. Ruben's attorneys wouldn't rule out filing a civil lawsuit. Last week, another shooting victim filed an $800 million lawsuit in connection with the shooting. And this is crazy. I mean, if you could get a billion dollar bag from getting shot in the face by Puff Daddy, everyone would be doing it. Hell, maybe that's how Elon Musk got his funding secured. But anywho, that civil trial was settled in 2011 and at least Natanya Rubin ended up getting $1.8 million. Not bad, but it ain't Akon though. Natanya spoke out about 15 years after this had even happened just to remind everyone about just how hard she'd had it. She said the news was sympathetic to the celebs rather than the victims. Puff Daddy went on to change his name to P Diddy to try and get away from this incident and improve his brand. And he just continued on with his career, making lackluster music and amusing hip hop fans the world over. I'm sure you can guess what Shine did after being sentenced to 10 years in jail. He sat in the slammer for 10 goddamn years. There was an interesting 2004 MTV interview with Shine while he was still behind bars. How would you describe the reality for those who might think they know what it's like? Oh no, this thing is for real. Like, you know, this, this thing is serious. You know, this is life or death. You, you die in here. Mm -hmm. You could die in here. And being here is like being dead, because you got people that ain't going home ever. And this is pretty interesting to return to today, because you still really get that impression that he felt like he was betrayed by Diddy. The dude told on me, you feel me? He sent witnesses to try to testify against me and all that. I was facing 25 years, so. Anything to help you in a situation? Absolutely not. He said on numerous occasions that if it wasn't for him shooting that night, Diddy and J-Lo wouldn't be alive today. But it's also clear that Shine's hardline no snitching mentality probably worked to his detriment because of the fact that he basically refused to say who shot at him first that night and never actually told the court up front who the hell he was defending himself against. I had to pull my gun out. I didn't pull it out and wave it around and say, you know, somebody want a piece of me. If, if you could have helped yourself out by identifying someone else or providing other information when you were in the stand, um, why you wouldn't do that? Because I was I was built like that, you know. There's certain rules that you know that you abide by, and this is the way I was brought up. That you don't you don't you know sacrifice anybody in order to spare yourself. I personally find it pretty fascinating that a rapper wouldn't even try and address to the court in order to get their freedom, who it was that was trying to kill them that night. I mean, when you look at what goes on these days with like 6 9 and the deal that he got to get an early release, it just boggles my mind, but I guess I'm not a street cat. But Shine goes on to say that he actually managed to negotiate back the rights to his recordings from Bad Boy Records and eventually went on to release a 2004 album called Godfather Buried Alive. This dropped in August 2004 after Shine managed to secure a new deal with Def Jam. He released that album from jail, it had a Kanye West beat on it and even a track that he'd recorded over the phone from prison. Godfather Buried Alive hit number three on Billboard which actually put Shine alongside Tupac as the only rappers to ever release a top 10 album from the slammer. That's not bad because usually the only hot bars getting dropped in jail are made of soap. But that wasn't the end of Young Shine and a lot of people that have really been into hip hop from day one will remember around 2009 the huge media hype in the hip hop news around his release. But unfortunately it wasn't all good times for Shine. As a non-US citizen that was never naturalized he was immediately deported from the country back to his native Belize. And since Biggie Small is dead he didn't even have anyone to smoke trees with. A year later he signed another ill-fated seven-figure deal with Def Jam Records but as soon as he started releasing music, he was universally panned for his incredibly deep, raspy voice that sounded like he'd just been sitting there for the last 10 years, chain smoking cigarettes. Slow bust the name game on rhyme like Poe, cause I rhyme like go. I rhyme like I be climbing out that rose. Oh, it's terrible. Terrible. 
At this point, Shine began to fade out of relevancy, and the only accolade that he achieved from this point on was scoring number 23 on Complex Magazine's worst fall-offs in hip-hop history. But Shine didn't just sit around doing nothing. He famously had a little guest spot on Lil Wayne's The Cart 4, and also went on to try and get attention by dissing some of your favorite actually good rappers. He went at The Game, Rick Ross, and even Kendrick Lamar, who he famously called trash after releasing his critically acclaimed album, Good Kid, Mad City. But to this day, he's still in Belize, and it looks like he's kind of trying to follow in the footsteps of his father, making some moves in politics and even opening a school in 2018. Good for him. I'll be honest with you, I've ripped Shine a lot in this video, but I do genuinely find his strength and ability to move past this incident and cope with his suffering pretty commendable and kind of inspirational. And now for the final loose end of this entire story is Matthew Scar Allen. What became of that street kid? Well, he was ironically shot in the head and killed outside Footprints nightclub in New York. Foxy Brown tells us the man killed in a deadly double shooting in East Flatbush is a friend of hers. Police are searching for the two men who shot Matthew Allen once in the head yesterday afternoon. He died at the hospital. So there you have it, the true story about how Shine, Diddy, and J-Lo got into it and got off. In summary, I don't think anybody came out of this situation looking good. I mean, Diddy was with J-Lo, one of the baddest chicks in the world, and ended up getting her taken by a backup dancer and ruining the whole thing. Shine got 10 years in jail and got deported, and he's never able to come back to the United States of America. That sucks. A woman got shot in the face and was publicly humiliated. Nothing cool about that either. Frankly, I see this as a cautionary tale of bravado gone wrong at Bad Boy Records. I know that this is gangster rap music, but really, at the end of the day, it's not really that cool to be going around with guns. It's not really that cool to be shooting up the club, leaving people hurt, and going through an awful public legal trial. That's not cool. There's nothing cool about doing 10 years in jail, and there's nothing cool about being stuck in goddamn Belize. If you like that video, make sure that you go and check out my recent one on how young Dolph got shot up a hundred times during his beef with Joe Gotti. And also, if you want to support the channel more, go check out my merch store and grab yourself a Trapdoor Ross t-shirt. Thanks very much, and until next time, peace out.